You are listening to The Cycling Podcast in association with Rafa, the fastest clothing in the world tour, the home of cycling with character. Ride and watch with Rafa in 2019 as they partner EF Education First and Canyon SRAM. This week we're in our gate. Where are we, Lionel? We're in the Rafa Cafe in Harrogate. How many pop-up takes cafe. did that take? Um, it's been a long day, Richard. I got very cold and wet out there, <laughs> and I'm just sort of rebooting now. You need a hat. <laughs> I, a hat. Hat warm, like. I need some new shoes. My my, uh, I trod in a quite a deep puddle up at the mix zone uh, this evening when you when you, um, you you threw me a bit of a, a, a hospital pass. Um, hmm. Well, um, what have we, I mean, we've had the under-23 men's time trial thing, the women's uh, time trial. Um, we'll be putting out an episode of the second podcast, Femina, tomorrow morning, and that will have a lot about about the women's time trial in it and some interviews. We're going to talk about it as well. We're, we're here with Rob Hatch as well. Hello. Hello, Rob. How are you? I had to rush off at the end of the women's time trial because I was doing an event here at Rafa with Cassia Niviadoma and Rob. Kasia Nevidoma, the Canyon SRAM rider, um, who is uh, riding for Poland on Saturday in the road race. We'll hear a little bit from that event a bit later on. She was great. She was brilliant, wasn't she? Really enjoyed listening to her. Really interesting and definitely one of the favourites for Saturday's road race, I think. Um, And uh, yeah, she was interesting on the Dutch team as well. Um, Lionel, do you want to give us a little... uh, Tell us what happened in the under-23 time trial, first of all. Well, Richard... Um, it's been a day dominated by weather, hasn't it, really? It, it really has. It's been extremely wet today. I feel bad starting this podcast complaining about getting one wet right foot. Well, I've only got one right foot, but getting my right foot wet. But I was submerged up to uh, up to ankle depth in water oh, earlier. Poor thing, Lionel. I know. Um, they had to close the fan zone up at the finish line today at around about noon because it was just waterlogged up there, and um, that was a that was a real shame. Uh, I think you know there's this kind of stoicism about the atmosphere around town today, and a real hope that the weather forecast is going to be. Um, or the weather is going to be better for the next few days. I think tomorrow it will be actually all right. And and hopefully, um, although we'll hear from Dean Downing a little bit later, but one of the things he was, was saying was that, you know, the Yorkshire weather is unpredictable. You you can't really, even with the forecast, you can't necessarily say that the, the rain has set in until it's set in. But it really did set in today, didn't it? And um, How's your right foot? Is well, it recovering? It's, it's still damp. It's still damp, Richard. <laughs> Um, I've changed my sock, but the shoe is uh, the shoe. It's, it's it's the gazelles, the Adidas gazelles on <laughs> the Paris Bay stage. Get rid of them over again. You need some newspaper, don't you? I, I, and I do. Morning, it'll be I dry. <laughs> Perfect. The old method. Um, post. Yeah, yeah. Well, you know, I'm 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 a I'm a confidence player, aren't I, Rich? You know, a, a damp foot can really upset my my <laughs> level of performance here. Um, and yeah, I feel bad complaining because obviously I came off much less um, you didn't badly. Have to go swimming. You didn't have to go swimming like half the riders did. No, the, well, there were a couple of really bad um, crashes, weren't there, in the men's under-23 uh, time trial this morning. The weather was, was bad. There was a lot of standing water on the course. Um, we saw a couple of riders aquaplaning and, and oh, well, somersaults. No two ways about it. And um, the Danish rider who went under the water and, and came up as if he'd, he'd, he'd jumped into the shallow end of the swimming pool. It was quite extraordinary. Deep end. Or the deep even. end even. Um, but uh, Mikkel Björk of Denmark won the under-23 time trial for the third year in a row. And, well, he's quite a talent, isn't he? And he will be riding professionally for UAE Team Emirates next year, as will the bronze medalist Brandon McNulty of the USA. He's been riding with the rally a team this year had some really great results in the spring. I actually spoke to him at Flesh Will Own um, earlier on in the spring, but we we didn't play that um, in in any of the podcasts for some reason. I don't know don't know why. We would have to dig it out. Um, play it's it at some lost in the archives, waiting to appear in an episode of Auntie's Bloomers in ten years or something like that. Well, no, there's no bloomers about it. I mean, he's clearly uh, a clearly a, a big an talent. Interview. <laughs> clearly a big talent, and he was one of two Americans on the podium because the silver medalist was Ian Garrison um, of the USA as well. But Björg's winning margin, 26 seconds, was um, impressive. But then, the, I mean, the story of the day is is how well Chloe Diger Owen of the USA 
did in the women's time trial. I mean, she absolutely blew the field away, didn't she, Rich? Well, there was talk of the women's time trial not not happening, or, uh, and then it was delayed because the weather was so bad, and there were parts of the course that were were very dangerous, and they actually cordoned them off for for the women. Um, it was an astonishing performance by her. You know, Annemiek van Vluten has won the last two World Time Trial Championships. Uh, Anna van der Breggen, that's the fourth time she's finished second in the time trial. And, you know, they weren't just beaten, they were hammered. I mean, uh, van der Breggen was a minute and a half down, uh, van Vluten almost two minutes down. That was inconceivable. I mean, she's been winning time trials by that sort of margin at the Giro Rosa and so on. And what's fascinating about it is just that Chloe Diger owen um, you know, she's a, a, a very good track rider. She won the junior road and time trial titles in 2015 she's 22 years old and um she doesn't race much against these riders you know she she raced in america for an american team and she's combining track as well so she was a real unknown coming into the race although she won four stages of the colorado classic recently you know she's not doesn't race regularly against these other riders so it was it was a fascinating kind of uh matchup yeah, I think on the, in terms of what we're seeing now on the road, a lot of riders will have known and heard about her and her performances on the track. They knew she was coming. They heard about what happened in the Junior World Championships previously, but this was, this was a performance that blew everybody away. And I think I'm right in saying, somebody might know a little better, but I'm pretty sure that that's the biggest winning margin in a time trial in any of the elite time trials that we've ever had since the event started 25 years ago. And, and it solidified the United States' place as the most successful nation ever in winning elite women's time trials. I think it's seven now since they won the first one in 1994. That's right. Karen Kurek won in Agrigento in uh, Sicily in 94, the first time that there were individual time trials in the World Championship. Chris Boardman won the, 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 the men's title that year i'm almost certain that's right that's right isn't it rich chris what year sorry 94 chris yes. Boardman. um but the other american winners since then marie holden in 2000 in plue i was there don't don't remember that i remember the, the fact that jenny longo was beaten and which was quite a uh you know quite a, a story at the time the, the the great french rider who well she won pretty much everything multiple times other americans christian armstrong a couple of times and amber naban of course who coaches a of uh, chloe diger owen that's right, and Amber Naben, who's won twice, who was was uh, was fourth today. Um, I was going to say just off the podium, but actually the gap was was big. It was uh, forty five seconds uh, or there or or so. Um, but a really impressive performance. And uh, well, we'll hear from Chloe Diger Owen in the episode of the Cycling Podcast Feminine, which will be out either late tonight or or tomorrow. But she um, she did make that point, Rich, about not really knowing the level where she'd slot in against these. Riders because she's not really raced um, this kind of level on the road for a couple of years. But you mentioned about the the, the, the question marks over whether the women's time trial would even go ahead this afternoon. I gather um, that there weren't serious discussions about cancelling or postponing sim- simply because it would have made the scheduling even more complicated tomorrow um, but they did do quite an impressive job of cleaning up the course uh, we'll hear from Dean Downing in the next part who's one of the uh, drivers for the commissaires and uh, well the fire brigade came out and pumped the road the water company were out pumping water off the road and they did manage to put cones out to to warn riders to keep off the in the two really difficult parts it was on the right hand side out of the deep keeping them out of the deep end but uh, Chloe Diger and Annemiek van Vluten both did didn't make anything of the fact that there was you know a change to the rhythm and routine of the afternoon it was the same for everyone and Chloe Diger made a very good point that you know she races on the track um, well used to having a final coming up that might be delayed because of extra heats in other events and what have you so um, that, but they did have to adapt to some pretty challenging conditions out there the fastest clothing in the world tour the home of cycling with character Ride and watch with Ratha in 2019 as they partner EF Education First and Canyon SRAM. Thank you very much to Rafa. Um, and we're in the Rafa pop-up here in Harrogate, uh, which is very, very nice. It's big, isn't it? Over two floors, three floors? Two, two and a half, three floors. Yeah, sort of a, we're on a... There's a mezzanine. Me- there? There's a mezzanine. <laughs> if we were, the word if we were estate agents, this will be a well-presented mezzanine. 
deceptively there's, spacious. Um, but there's some w- World Champions jerseys on the wall, which is a which is a nice touch. Obviously, um, you know the rainbow bands very well um, represented. What have we got there? We've got uh, Vasil Kirienka's time trial uh, rainbow jersey there. We've got a, a Wiggins l- jersey. I'm not sure where that would be. Fake, from. fake. Madison. That was from the oh, Madison. Sorry, apologies. Very good. Well done, Rob. And uh, the, the the Yorkshire edition Rafa jersey, uh, quite a fetching um, checkerboard sort of uh, design. Yeah, ev- it, it would be better if it had the red rose on it, obviously, but even as a Lancashire, I've got to say that that's not a bad jersey. <laughs> and Richard's wearing the, the, the hat from that collection as well. I mean, yeah, yes. I mean, it's a nice mm. hat. Thank you. He looks rather silly, in it? <laughs> Thank, thanks, guys. Um... Uh, yeah, um, so we were here earlier with uh, Kashi Nividoma and, and you, Rob, and I gather the Kanye Sram team who are competing on Saturday in the Women's Road Race are all going to be here on Saturday night. And I think they've got other riders coming out. Mandy Jones, the World Road Race champion in 1982, is coming here tomorrow night. And it's going to be the victory party, isn't it? Because Kasia Nividoma has already told us what the podium will yeah. be. She knows already. She's going to win alone on Saturday. Mm-hmm. And uh, Lizzie Dagnan is going to be second. And Annemiek van Vluten third. Is that correct? That was correct. Yeah, that's going to be her podium. She's even uh, drawn uh, drawn that in her journal. Um, she's drawn the podium with her on the top step. So she's also been watching Michal Kwiatkowski's uh, win at the 2014 World Championships in Ponferrada for inspiration the last couple of days. She loves the circuit. Watch out for her. Um, We'll hear a little bit from our event at the end of tonight's episode um, and her reaction to Chloe Digert's win. Well, just on Chloe Digert, one thing we didn't mention in the first part is I think that uh, Seb Piquet tweeted this, that her time was good enough, would have been good enough to put her in 12th place in the men's under 23. And, of course, she's under 23 herself. So, I mean, that's a really interesting comparison and it just just shows you the, 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 you know, the level that she's operating at there. It was an amazing ride. I mean, she, she beat, yeah, World Tour pros. She beat Mark Hershey. She beat, um, you know, riders who've signed for World Tour teams next mm-hmm. year. Really remarkable. And, and it continues what we've been talking about, the theme of this season, really. He's talking she's an under-23 rider. She's another young rider who's come through to the very top and beaten established professionals. We're talking about two superstars who are there just beneath her on the podium, Anna van der Brecher and Annemiek van Vleuten, Olympic champions, world champions. She's beaten the very best and by the biggest margin ever. Be wary, everybody. Do tune in to the Cycling Podcast Feminine, which will be released tomorrow morning. We'll hear from Chloe Diger, Annemiek van Vleuten, a very emotional Ashley Moulman Passio, Audrey Cordon Rigaud, Hayley Simmons, very interesting on how the the delay and the question over whether the race would go ahead um, affected her, her warm-up. You know, she's very dialed in terms of needing to finish her warm-up at a certain time. And, you know, very interesting. So um, that will be released, I think, tomorrow morning. Lionel. There's also an interview in that with William Fotheringham about his new book on Beryl Burton. Mm. And uh, Rose Manley and I look ahead to the road race on Saturday. Shall we hear from Dean Downing? Yeah. Um, Dean Downing, national crit champion back in the day, um, stalwart of the Premier Calendar, uh, decent track rider as well, and Yorkshire Cycling Royalty. Yorkshire Cycling Royalty, along with his brother Russell, shared a broom wagon with him once um, Did you? at the Lands Classic, I think it was called in Hull, so not far East Riding. Wow! Uh, in 1999, I believe. Well, he's driving one of the commissaires during all of the races, and the commissaires had a pretty tricky job today because there was a lot of um, catching going on and that's where the, in the time trials the commissaires are keeping their eyes open for any illegal drafting and and, uh, and what have you and also the, the, the logistical challenges um, you know with regard to uh, you know suddenly the, the women's race the, the time gaps between the riders were um, changed from a minute and a half to a minute so it, it really ups you know everyone had to adapt very quickly I think you know they, you, they can't legislate for the weather obviously I mean I have seen a few comments on Twitter about well this is bound to happen if you have a world championships in the north of England in late September. July in the Alps in the Tour de France, uh, August in Spain and Andorra. Ah, come on. Quite, quite right, Rob. Yes. Um, but yeah, Dean Downing driving the, the commissaires. And uh, well, I wanted to get a sense from him um, about what the conditions were like for not just the under 23 men, but also for the women this afternoon. But also uh, just pick his brains a little bit about what it means to have the World Championships here in Yorkshire 37 years after the Road World Championships were last held in the UK. 
Well, Dean, this is uh, good Yorkshire weather, isn't it, today? Yep, welcome to Yorkshire. Um, yeah, it's been a bit grim today. Um, we just finished the uh, women's race, and it's actually better than it was for the U23s. Um, yeah, a lot of standing water. Um, I was um, I've been driving Commissaire cars all week. I think most people would see on social media that there was quite a few crashes. I think a Danish guy hit one of the, like, yeah, just aquaplaned himself into the into the into the puddle <laughs> yeah so uh, yeah would, would you have trained in this <laughs> never <laughs> not a chance i used to hate the rain uh, and yeah to be fair most people wouldn't train in this nowadays there's you know there's quality indoor training sessions you can do nowadays but um yeah it's the world championship so they can't say oh, i'm not going to ride boss to the to the ds and the manager of the uh, national national team so yeah the lads got on with it uh, the women got on with it I mean, it was borderline this morning, though, wasn't it, with the standing water on the course? Because I guess people didn't know, no one knew until they got out onto the course just how bad it was. Yeah, that's right. So we, as a, as a commissaire driver, I was out in the first wave on the under-23s. Of, we went we behind uh, the rider number three on the road, and we were, we were shocked at how bad the, the lines for the race were. Um, big standing water puddles. Uh, and as the commissaire who, who I was driving for was relaying that back, to other commissaires who were behind and it was just yeah it was pretty biblical rain for that race was there any way to convey that to the riders or were they just finding the conditions as they came to them um so how it works um the commissaires go on to radio tour then and they can radio tour that they can say that back so all teams who are in the vicinity can hear that uh, and then said PK's in charge of radio tour, so he relays that. Um, you know, be, be careful, kilometre eight, there's a large puddle on the left hand side of the road, for example. So that's how that happens. Um, but yeah, we did the U23 race. Uh, commissaires had a meeting about the results and things, and then we all turned around as a convoy of five, six vehicles who were driving for the commissaires. The head commissaire was there, and we retraced the route. You know, on closed roads to see how bad it had got, and there was one at eight kilometres from the start that was across the road, um, and it was like, you know, over ankle deep. Uh, there was people from like the water board there trying to do things, and one of the one of the uh, the UCI managers, Vincent, he was on the phone, and from what I understand, that's why it was delayed, uh, and they got the fire brigade in to pump it, so all the teams would have been told about that. We set off again in the women's car three or rider three. We got to eight kilometres in and it was gone. So that's pretty good from an organising point of view that in a half an hour they've turned it round from being, you know, a foot deep across the road to clear. So, Especially as it's rained non-stop. I mean, it didn't stop raining between the under-23 men's race and the women's race and it's rained all, constantly all afternoon as well. So um, to get the roads as clear as they were for the women's race, a pretty impressive effort really. Yeah, and that's yeah, that's the view of the organisers as a whole. You've got like UCI Sporting, who then relay it safety-wise, and then you've got people, you know, the police are here, and you know, they get in contact with the fire brigade, I guess. And yeah, within within a half an hour, it, the main obstacles on that 40k, uh, 30k course were just gone, um, and that's pretty impressive that the, the ladies still had to ride in the rain, but they all got on on with it. Some fantastic times. Um, yeah, so did it come close to being postponed this afternoon? I mean, they delayed by about 40 minutes, I think. But were, were the commissaires talking about possibly postponing and, and trying tomorrow morning instead? Uh, not that I heard of anything like that. No, um, I've not been on social media much cause <laughs> in the cars and stuff, but I didn't hear of anything like that. I just had a, a, a WhatsApp from in a group that we're in for drivers to say that it's been delayed until half past three. So yeah, I was around the start. I didn't hear any news of that. So, so, you might have done, I don't know. Chute, chute à l'arrière du peloton, cycling podcast, team car, the back of the pack, please. Well, that's Seb Piquet, the voice of Radio Tour at the Tour de France, interrupting our episode to remind us on this occasion to tell you that this episode is sponsored by LACA. LACA is a specialist bicycle insurance company with a difference. Your premiums are based on the claims made by members of the community each month. So if there are no claims, there's no premium. LACA says their members have saved on average 61% insuring their bikes and equipment with them. And premiums are also capped, so there can't be any unwelcome surprises. LACA cover your bikes and equipment from theft, damage, travel abroad and all 
Also, they'll cover you in races and sportives as long as you're not a professional rider. And because Lacquer serves a community of cyclists, they know what they're covering and how to replace your bikes and gear when something goes wrong. So let's hear from Jens Hartvig, one of the founders of Lacquer, who can tell us what happens when a Lacquer customer has to make a claim and how they can get you back on the road quickly. So the moment you sign in into our website and basically just submit the claim, upload a video of yourself quickly telling us what happened, um, telling us where and when. Um, from our side, we are then just really looking, okay, what happened to the bike? Are there any deadlines for you? Are you having a holiday coming up where we really need the bike for? Um, and then we're really looking at like, what is the best solution for you as a, as a member of, of the community and what's the best outcome for the community overall? Because we are basically um, the middleman, so to speak, to to um, to get the best outcome for everyone. So um, let's say um, classic example, you crashed on a race, uh, your right shifter and your right rear mech is broken. And now you want to get those replaced. We would usually work with a local shop to um, to get you these parts and uh, get them fitted as fast as possible. On average, that's usually around um, less than seven days um, and you're back on the road. So if you'd like to join Lacquer's community and save on your insurance, go to lacquer.co.uk. That's lacquer.co.uk, spelled L-A-K-A dot co dot UK. Well, we heard before the break there from Dean Downing, um, who's got an important job this week. Just an email from the UCI, Lionel. Mm. Um, we, last night, we stepped outside at about 7.20 from Betty's, our usual residence in Betty's, and and it was really quite dark, and we realised that the, the men's under-23 well, road race... It was dark. It was dark. Hmm. The men's under-23 road race on Friday was scheduled to finish around about that time, and or just after 7, and we thought, are they going to have, have lights? Or, you know, what are they going to do? It's properly dark. I've just an email that they've changed the start time. Ten minutes earlier, it will start, and one lap um, of the Harrogate circuit has been removed. Uh, this is, you know, there's nothing you can do about it, the weather, but this is staggering mm. that this was scheduled yeah. for, you know, everybody knows when it gets dark. But do you know why the, the, the under-23 road race has to be so late? It's because of where yeah. it starts and all of the vehicles have all got, well, Seb was talking about this, have all got to get back out uh, having after the finish of the, the, the morning's race. Got to get back out there to the start. It's about an hour and a quarter away and you've got to build in a bit of time there. But you're absolutely right. It, I mean, this is uh, This is kind of, this is supposed to be basic guys the under 23s the pinnacle of their season and now they're racing a shorter distance than than they thought they if were if it is wet i know and if it is wet imagine how how dangerous it could be in a failing I mean, light dicky bird lives down the road get his light meter out Wait, headingley's not far away is it you, you know that after 6 p.m. you can't bowl your fast bowlers at headingley there's four lights on the board come on guys don't know what you're, i don't know what you're talking this, about this Rob. is a cricket reference uh, richard Very um awesome. You know, they, they know what they're talking about around here, don't they? <laughs> Just imagine, Richard, you know, when it gets to a certain darkness, it's very very unsafe to toss the caber. So just in case, because no one no one would be able to see where it lands. It's very similar, very similar. Mm. Um, it's too dark. <laughs> oh, dear. God, that sounded almost Flemish. Oh, dear, oh, dear. Anyway, um, moving on. Uh, time trial tomorrow. Um, men's time trial. What, mm. what, do we, what do we expect from that? Well... Ordinarily, you would say Rowan Dennis is going to repeat his victory from last year, wouldn't you? I mean, he was impressive last year. Big winning margin over Tom de Moulin, 121. And, and Victor Campanets was, was very close to de Moulin. Um, but Rowan Dennis hasn't raced since the, the really strange and unusual withdrawal from the Tour de France on the stage to Bagnier de Bigorre, where he effectively downed tools for whatever reason. And we, I mean, we... We, we've we've winkled out a little bit of information about what was what was wrong there. Dissatisfaction with the with the kit, the bikes, and all, all the rest of it. We do gather from our moles and 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 spies that there won't be an awful lot of Bahrain Merida branding on uh, any of his uh, on any of his kit or bike. It'd be really interesting to see whether there's even a logo on his on his um, skin suit or you know and and what bike he's on. Um, but we understand that he's raring for it, ready to go. And, uh, well, I wouldn't put it past him repeating just on on sort of, you know, f willpower and, and a determination to get back in the saddle after what must have been quite an unusual and difficult few months for him. Yeah, the talk is the power numbers are better than ever. The people around him think that he is 
going to do it. We know that he's focused on it because this is the only thing that's left in his season. As you mentioned, he, he hasn't raced since we wondered where he'd gone on that day at the Tour de France. We know he's a great operator, a hugely talented athlete. And when he focuses on something, when he gets the mental aspect right, he is one of the top athletes in the discipline that I think we've ever seen. Rowan Dennis, we're told up for it, and I guess we've got to believe that. But what I'm really looking forward to seeing is how Remco Evenepoel does um, for Belgium. Um, I mean, they've got Campanets, Victor Campanets and Evenepoel, both potential medalists. Uh, people are sort of saying, well, Evenepoel, you know, maybe top five, maybe on the podium, but who knows? I mean, he's he, this time last year, he was riding in the junior events and he won both of them. He, last year, he won junior... Uh, road race and time trial at national, European and world level. This year he won the senior European time trial championships in Alkmaar, beat Kasper Asklin, uh, his trade team teammate, of course, and Eduardo Affini, who also won the time trial at the Tour of Britain uh, a couple of weeks ago. So, you know, there's, there's pedigree there. And I gather that Evenepoel will have a new specialised bike as well, which they're very excited about. And, um, well, well, we'll have to see how he does. But I'm, I think a medal is not out of the question. Another guy who's been very vocal in saying, I am feeling better than ever, is, and he's not always been that confident, certainly publicly. With regards to Kapanats, if, uh, Kapanats, pardon me, if the, the weather continues to be like it is, his girlfriend's a swimmer, so I'm going be getting some tips. <laughs> <laughs> I was going to do a siren noise there for the slight misstep on the pronunciation there, Rob. Bit of a cock up there, sorry. You know, I mean, there's nothing worse than a corrupt policeman, is there? <laughs> <laughs> um, but when you look at the start list and the, and the, the back end of it, I mean, uh, we've got the, the, in reverse order, of, you know, D Dennis is off last as defending champion. Campanets, Primoz Roglic, how will he come out of the Vuelta? Will he, will he have done too much? Asgreen, Oliveira, Hager... Stefan Kuhn, Tony Martin, Jonathan Castroviejo. I mean, lots of riders who were up there in the top 10 last year. So we could be looking at a fairly similar sort of result uh, as, as we had last year. I suppose from last year's top 10, the big absentee is Mikhail Kwiatkowski, who was fourth, um, well off the podium, but was fourth last year. Um, but I can't see further than, well, I, I hate predictions anyway, but Dennis... Roglic. Evenepoel. The Cycling Podcast is supported by Science in Sport. Science in Sport. Fueled by science. Thank you very much indeed to Science in Sport for their support of the Cycling Podcast. And if you want to stock up on all your sports integration products, go to scienceinsport.com and at the checkout enter the code SISCP25. Uh, thank you indeed to science and sport very grateful to them do they have waterproof gels for um thursday's ride that we're doing the world championships waterproof gels they come in waterproof packets they do Lionel. they so do don't worry about that um you'll be fine um now chaps something completely different i met this morning with a, a guy called mike mcsherry um who is running an art project in uh, bradford where the women's road race starts on saturday and while well, he explains it better than I can, um, let's hear all about the art project that's r running in Bradford and also a, a special offer to listeners of the Cycling Podcast. I'm Michael McSherry, I'm from uh, The Open Wheel. And um, this week, for the, to coincide with the World Championships in Bradford, we've got an exhibition called Welcome to Goma, um, which is at the Theatre and Mill's new venue in Centenary Square. How did this come about? Uh, we've, the Open Wheel uh, is me and my brother Brendan and Finn, and we've been running a sportive in Yorkshire called the West Riding Classic since 2010. And in 2016, we read about this club, Goma Cycling Club, um, in an article, and we really liked them. And we thought, well, maybe if we raise a small amount of money through our sportive, that might be useful for them. So we got in touch, and they said, yes, please. Um, and since then, we've just had a relationship with them, and they're really, really sound, really, really uh, brilliant cycle club doing amazing stuff out in Goma. And to be honest, I didn't know anything about Goma until I read it. I didn't know where it was, what the circumstances were. I didn't know there was a volcano there or this enormous lake or that it was on the border of Rwanda or that there was a million refugees. Or I just didn't know anything about it. Um, but now, 
through through this cycling connection, us as cyclists and them as cyclists, um, I've got to know all about the place, and I've got to know them, and they're just really, really, really cool people doing good stuff. So in December 2018, we sent out um, some camera equipment to them, and then since then they've been uh, interviewing themselves and uh, filming various bits and pieces, and we've edited that into a 10-minute documentary, and we've also created this virtual reality experience um, to to complement it, which is what the basis of this exhibition. You're saying that you know the, the volcano is obviously a big part of life here, and it's still a threat to you know, that comes across in, in the film that it might erupt again. But they are the road network. Can you explain the, the 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 extent of the road network and 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 you know the looking at the the the, the, the virtual reality thing and the film. Um, you know, there's this kind of rubble um, all around, so there's constant reminders, I guess, of the yeah. volcano. Yeah, I think there's, there's a few things that would sort of define the narrative of the place as understood by us in, like, the, the north, and that is that it's an area of extreme uh, levels of, of conflict and poverty and environmental uh, jeopardy. So from the conflict point of view, we're all, we're all f- familiar with uh, like the Rwandan uh, genocide, but after the Rwandan genocide, there's subsequently been a number of wars, and those collectively have created a million refugees, and that's basically the, the population of Goma. On top of that, you've you've got um, a political instability and you've got um, in, the, in the film Charlie Gee who's the founder of the club talks about the fact that 70 or more armed groups in the region around Goma and then you've also got this incredible volcano which has already erupted twice in the last like 15 years and could erupt at any minute and is extremely powerful it's the sort of thing that you would think is so phenomenal as like a piece of uh, the earth's planet that you'd think it's be famous and we'd all know about it but I don't know about you but I'd never heard about it so they live in in the shadow of all these things but what really comes across when you get to know them and hopefully comes across in the film and hopefully comes across in the VR experience and the portraits that they've made is um, they're not defined by any of these things they are really defined by their own personality and their own ambitions and um, they've got um, they're really, really nice people, and they've got big dreams, and they've got big hearts, and they love cycling. And it turns out they're really good at it as well. Um, and uh, yeah, so that's kind of the context of which they live in. In respect to the road specifically, there are only about 20 kilometres of tarmac road in the whole of Goma, which is a city of a million people, and they're the roads that they use um, for training. Yeah. And we see in the film big groups of, of cyclists. Um, and Rwanda, you mentioned, that there's a, a big cycling kind of culture in Rwanda um, and in other parts, Eritrea as well. But I'm not sure, I didn't know that there was, that, that existed in, in, in Congo as well. I mean, what, what, um, what do you know about that? Is, there, is, that, is that a historical thing? They obviously speak French, this is a French, French influence. I mean, uh, where does it come from, do you know? Well, uh, the bits in the film that you're, I think you're referring to are actually in Rwanda. So when they compete in races, they go to Rwanda to compete or they go to other African countries to compete, sometimes to Kinshasa, the capital. But on the whole, they go, they do their, ra- their competitive racing in Rwanda. So obviously in Rwanda, cycling is an enormous uh, thing. Um, and it's re- one of the impacts that this club have had on themselves and on the city is that they've really changed perceptions of of themselves for themselves but also for others so they some of the members of the club also do um, du- duathlons and um, there was a, a big duathlon competition in, in Rwanda which is just literally two or three miles away from, from Goma and um, they were competing and uh, with international competitors from like California and wherever Australia and after the uh, after the race um, this was cut out of film we didn't make it onto the film but they were they were saying that, um, it was brilliant because people were coming over to us and saying I didn't know um, Congolese did running and swimming and they were saying here I am I'm Congolese and I'm running and swimming so it's like that like very real changing of perceptions that's uh, been going on
And what what you describe what people experience in Bradford? I mean, um, what 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 do you want to achieve this week? Are you getting people that, that that live in Bradford to come along? Are people there for the World Championships? I mean, people are visiting Yorkshire for the Worlds. I guess you would you would like them to come along and experience it. Oh, very much, yeah. Uh, we've, we've been open since Saturday and we've had a fantastic response um, from the people in Bradford already. There's already been a few uh, visitors coming through. Some people who who know us from our rides have come specifically to come and see what we've been doing. Um, but obviously on Saturday we've got the women starting in Bradford and I think that's going to be a really fantastic um, event and day all around and I think Bradford's going to be absolutely rammed and we are really right on the start line we're about 50 yards from the start line the installation is in Bradford Centenary Square um, it's a theatre in the mill if you go to Centenary Square you'll find it very easily it's open 12 to 5 during the week on Saturday for the women's racing it's open 9 till 5 um, and also uh, we've got a special invite for subscribers of this podcast um, if you'd like we've got a breakfast opening on Thursday from 10.30 till 12 um, it's just uh, yeah, you're welcome to come to that in terms of what we're trying to achieve we just this is a kind of the whole installation is kind of a self-portrait made by the club they've shot it they've taken the photos they've done the interviews and we've edited it together um, in collaboration with them and I, when the sort of uh, working title for uh, the whole installation when we were putting it together was um, the art of participation and what we really feel and I hope we've got it across is that when you come together and you do stuff together and you get involved that can lead to things changing for you and changing for your site in a good way and not like any grand thing which is going to like change the world but it can change your immediate uh, experience positively and hopefully that's what comes across it's hopefully it's fun hopefully um it's uplifting that's certainly our ambition so that's Mike McSherry there. All the best things about the World Championships, I think. A really fantastic international project showcasing a, a cycling club in uh, the Democratic Republic of uh, Congo um, in a city called Goma, which I wasn't familiar with, but the right on the border with Rwanda, the, the riders, and there's lots of them. I watched the film that they've made, uh, and big groups of, of bike riders on this 20-kilometre network of roads that they've got there. They race in Rwanda quite a lot, where we know there's a a big cycling culture. Um, so if you get a chance to go along to that in Bradford, go along and have a look. And especially Thursday morning or Saturday when the road race, the women's road race starts there. Just looking ahead again to the time trial tomorrow, if Tony Martin were to get a medal of any colour, he would become the outright most medalist, most meddling Medal. rider meddling us in the 25 and a bit year history of this Best. discipline. Um, edging won, won the most medals. Cu- yeah. He would edge ahead of uh, Fabian Cancellaro. I mean, technically on sort of count back, he's just ahead of Cancellaro because he's got four golds, a silver and two bronze, whereas Cancellaro's got four golds and three bronze and he's unlikely to add to that tally. Let's be Fading honest. force, though, isn't he, Tony Martin? <laughs> he's a fading force. <laughs> well, you're going to say Cancellaro's a fading force. <laughs> he's a faded force. Yeah. Well, one, one little thing today, we were having lunch, the three of us, and uh, a very, very oh. generous podcast listener... Um, went and settled the bill for us mm. without us knowing and then he came to the table and said what he'd done and we were very grateful also stunned we're by all this. A bit, I was going to say we're all a bit stunned weren't we we didn't really know how to react so sorry to, to Gary if we, if we didn't engage in, in well Gary was his name yeah so um, Gary if you're listening get in touch because we'd like to offer you a little something as a thank you um, and uh, that, that was a very kind thing to do um, so thank you very much um, Extremely. I mean, had I known in advance, I'd have ordered more. <laughs> no, <laughs> of course I'm you would. Joking. I'm joking. <laughs> they are not. They I had not. just the right amount. Anyway, <laughs> um, we should leave it there, fellas. We'll be back tomorrow. As I say, there's an episode of the Cycling Podcast Femina coming out as well, um, imminently. Uh, but, oh, I was going to play out with a little bit of Cassia Neviadoma from earlier tonight. We were chatting in this very room in the Rafa pop-up in Harrogate. Um, and yeah, she's the one to look out for uh, at the weekend. Let's hear a little bit from our event earlier. She's not there now. Why are you looking? You're looking round just to where well, she, uh, where um, the where the future world champion a, was sitting. It's a just recent a couple of hours. It's ago. a recent memory, uh, Lionel. Uh, let's hear from her now. Thank you, Lionel. <laughs> Thank you, Richard. Thank you, Rob. Thank you very much. What do you make of the winner? Though I don't know if you've all caught up, but Chloe Dyger Owen 
yeah. uh, won by a minute and a half from Anna van der Breggen. Yeah. It's incredible. It was outstanding performance. I was watching it and my jaw was just dropped, you know. I could not believe what was she doing because I was convinced that Anemic is going to win it because she was unbeatable this year. She was just performing like a star, never disappointing. And I know that if she wants to be good at certain race, she can prepare herself very well. So watching Chloe just like going, I don't know, like a beast, you know, on her bike. She was looking so strong and her body was just looking perfect. And definitely I kind of started to fear her for this Saturday's race. I was like, oh, I kind of overlooked her, but... Just don't She's let her get away so on her own. Strong. Yeah. Uh, yeah. <laughs> I just need to elbow her somehow. Well, I mean, the interesting thing is that she obviously, you know, she's a, a, a track rider as well. Yeah. Um, she doesn't race very often um, against you, you guys, world tour races and so on. Um, she doesn't race all that often on, on the road. So it's very yeah. difficult to know, to benchmark her, I suppose. Mm, yeah, I would also say that right now, women's women's racing is kind of crazy because everyone is so nervous and stressful and everyone wants to be in the front and of course here with those small roads and many corners it's impossible that 150 girls will be in the front so definitely you have to have those feelings that you usually get after spring classics it's like you have to be feisty you have to be like gutsy rider you have to know that you have to just risk and you can't overthink and if she wasn't racing any of those spring classics, it might be difficult for her to find herself in this peloton. And worlds are also kind of special race because you have a lot of riders that normally do not race with us, like girls from countries that I even don't know how to call. I don't want to <laughs> be rude, it's not, not like this. But like they don't have the right bike skills. So you really have to be cautious, like you have to know that, okay, I cannot get stuck behind certain rider because then my race might be over. Mm -hmm. So it's like, you can't be thinking only about the finish line because race start on one point and you have to be so concentrated and focused and like knowing where you are in the peloton and who's around you and then just like chase your dreams. Do you? Do you enjoy that or are you good at that fight, that, that battle for position? It's so crazy because like right now when I sit here, I always feel like, oh no, it's so stressful. I don't like it. But the moment the start is given, I kind of change into this weird girl that really want to be there and I don't care about anyone. I just want to be there, you know, and you kind of get into this mood that you just like fight for yourself that like nothing else matters, you know, you're just, it's like, oh, oh I want to be there, like get out of my way, you who, know? And who are the, I mean, I'm thinking probably Marina Voss and riders like that, who, who are the best riders? Because uh, as you say, these roads are, are quite yeah. tricky, technical, you know, who, who will that favor? Uh, Marianne Voss, Lucinda Brand, she's such a great descender and the way how she takes corners is just absolutely insane. I cannot follow her. So you, you mentioned two Dutch riders yeah, there. Again, and, Dutch, yeah, again, Dutchies, yeah. I mean, you've got Lucinda van Marne Vos, Annemiek van Vluten, Anna yeah. van der Breggen, and Chantal Black as well. Yeah, the world Amy champion. Peters. Amy Peters, European champion. So yeah. who, which of those riders do you watch? You just watch all of them? Yeah, or maybe none of them, you know? Mm. <laughs> yeah, and just like, I mean, there are a couple of good riders, not from Dutch Federation, like Lizzie or Ashley Mulman Pascio. Uh, Elisa Longoborghini from Italy. So I do believe that there might be certain riders from a different country, countries, but we could start working together somehow. I mean like against a Dutch team. Because it's impossible to be responding to every single attack made from a Dutch federation. And maybe, like this is my little hope, they might be working against of each other because each yeah, of them uh, wanna win, yeah. <laughs> girls that and we, happen. yeah. <laughs> and exactly, and we are girls, so girls, you know, right? <laughs> <laughs>